This is a message by Apostle Joshua Selman. What does vision do? It gives you focus. What does vision do? It gives you legitimacy to say no. When you are a visionary person, you have a legitimate ground to say no to many things. You must learn to say no even to good things. Let me tell you, when the devil brings evil and you say no, he will bring good. The most important thing is your destruction, whether through good or evil. You must learn to say no. When you are visionary, you can tell even nice friends who are, I, I'm happy for this, but I'm sorry, I may not have the time for this, will reconsider another opportunity. Vision. Hallelujah. Vision gives you the discipline to supervise yourself. The discipline to supervise yourself. First Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24. Paul was admonishing us and says that know ye not that they which run in a race he says they run all but only one receiveth the prize leaves you with a charge he says so run that ye may obtain run in such a way that at the end of your days your life would not have been wasted your energy would not have been wasted ministerially financially family wise maritally in every career wise he says run in a way that you will win hallelujah vision is the first key i can tell you by the mercies of god every ministry every business every individual i remember those days when we started we were not so many but every time we had the opportunity to gather i would say the future of this ministry was in that word he and I then, I would say that word I, international. The mandate was to the globe. Even when we had not gone anywhere, the mandate was to the globe. Are we together? The Zuckerbergs and the Elon Musks and all the people today that were celebrating, go and hear how they started. Some of them started in garages. Some of them started in rooms. Are we together now? And do you know for some of them, they still maintain such a lifestyle. Do you know why? because they are simulating an atmosphere that forces them to continue. I used to wonder why rich people deliberately make their life very modest. It's because they have found out that success beyond a level becomes cancerous. Let me repeat that. Success beyond a level becomes cancerous. It becomes a burden. First, success becomes an instrument of healing. It heals you from the perception of being a failure. Then it finally proves the point to all and sundry that you cannot be a failure again. Then it starts killing you. Most people do not know that you need to be trained to be successful. Then you need to be trained to manage success. I can tell you managing success is harder than becoming successful. Are we together? It's just that many people never really truly become successful. And so because they are obsessed with using success as a tool to heal themselves from the perception of being considered as failures, they will, no matter what the body needs, they will receive it with joy. It's like someone, um, let me just give a, a humorous example. It's like someone who is having his first opportunity to fly overseas, say for instance, are we together? And let's say he's transiting from one nation to the other. Do you know that even if you are going to spend two days on that journey, because it is your first journey, you are happy to sit down there in an airport over a transit flight for one whole day and you are still not angry. At least you left your country. For instance, are we together? Yes. But a time comes when as you travel again and again, that pressure, the point has been proven. You will now realize that such a journey is really a burden. And a time will come, you will deliberately reject such an offer because you now value other things greater than the need for validation, like your peace and your time. This is how it is with destiny. There are people who will not mind walking through fire, provided it will give people an expression of them being successful. And truly, because of your press, the point will eventually be proven. But when it is proven, you will now see the burden that comes when success is not managed. Who is learning tonight? The house of God is where we learn wisdom. So when God is telling you, take it easy, listen to him, he has never failed. It's not that he failed and learned from his failure. He has never failed. Are we together? Vision. Vision is very powerful. 
there is a benchmark listen there is an expectation man of God your expectation is not the program you organized thank God for it but if that is the only thing you have been clapping for till today then you are not doing well you need to trust God for grace there is a bar I look at koinonia every time I stand before you and let me tell you what I see I see what I'm doing now but there is a dissatisfaction in my heart because I compare what I'm seeing now to what was written in that old notebook and there is still a serious gap and so while I'm preaching to you I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying up to finish with you so that I'll go back and say ah God let's cover this gap let's cover this gap thank God for what we're doing across the nations thank God for the level of anointing thank God for the level of wisdom but there is more someone shout there is more one more time say there is more one of our lovely ladies sang a beautiful song and said there is more than this oh yes there is more there is more you must get angry within your heart and tell yourself there is more there is more thank God for the level of prosperity you have gotten to from begging and borrowing at least now you can pay your rent before you start wasting your time and having an arrival mentality you see that now for as long as you are still thinking about money and worrying about it and lying about it you have not you have not arrived so don't pat yourself at the back forever you are not the house owner thank God for what he has done but let there be a hunger in you the day you now buy your house thank God for it until the day you can give don't stop who is learning thank God for the man of God you know if I have any advice for people, especially, you know, sometimes people meet me who God is helping, giving visibility, and they say, Apostle, if you have any lesson, what would you teach me? I'll tell them, let me tell you. This success you see, you must learn how to manage it. If not, it will tear you like a wild animal. Because the higher you rise, the more impactful your fall is. If you're on the ground, you can fall and nobody knows. But when you are up, as you fall, it is even more painful. I remember a vision that I had many years ago. In that vision, I was in a program. I don't know how many times I've shared this. But I was in a program and um, I think it was the stage, a living faith stage. Like Canaan land, if I, rem if I recall. And then I was to stand and preach. But the way the stage was, you stand on the pulpit, not the ground. So there is a skill. If you don't know how to stand, you will fall. And I remember I stood there, I was shaking, but I was learning how to stand. I was not really, I didn't fall, but I was not stable at that time. When I woke up, I remember I wrote it down. I said, the devil is a liar. I must know how to stand on this thing. Listen, I've taught you, learn how to force life to work. Learn how to force life to work. I mean what I'm saying. If you think life will work on its own, you are wasting your time. Right from the days of John until now. Businessman, if it's not working, force it to work. More knowledge, more grace, more prayer, more counsel. Force it to work. What's the one thing holding you back from living the life God has called you to? I bet it's fear. Fear that whispers, you're not enough. You can't do it. You'll fail. But what if I told you God never intended for you to live in fear. In fact, he has given you everything you need to overcome it. Today, we're going to talk about how to break free from the chains of fear and walk in the boldness that God has already placed inside of you. And it all starts with one thing, faith. Let's dive in. Fear is something we all face. It can be paralyzing, overwhelming, and even make us doubt God's promises. But here's what we need to understand. Fear is not from God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let that sink in for a moment. Fear is not your identity. Power, love, and a sound mind are. Fear doesn't get the final say in your life. God's power does. I know some of you are watching this right now feeling like, Fear has gripped every area of your life. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of the unknown. But here's the good news. Jesus is greater than your fear. When you feel anxious or afraid, you're not meant to carry that weight alone. In fact, Jesus invites us in. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. 
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Fear can weigh you down. It can make you feel like you're carrying a burden too heavy to bear. But God is saying, come to me. Give that fear to me and I'll give you peace. When you put your trust in God, you start to realize that he's bigger than your fears. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 reminds us, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is literally promising that you don't have to do it alone. He's holding you up even when the fear feels overwhelming. What if instead of focusing on your fears, you started focusing on God's promises? Practical steps to overcome fear. So how do we practically overcome fear in our daily lives? Here are three key steps. Number one, meditate on God's word. The Bible is full of promises that combat fear. One of my favorites is Joshua chapter one, verse nine. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Read scriptures like this daily, remind yourself of God's truth, and fear will lose its grip on your heart. Number two, pray boldly. Prayer is not just asking God for things, it's an exchange. When you come to God in prayer, give him your fear and receive his peace. Philippians chapter four, verses six to seven tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Number three, take action in faith. Fear tries to freeze you in place, but faith moves you forward. Whatever God is calling you to do, do it despite the fear. That's where real courage comes from. Not the absence of fear, but moving forward, through it with the strength of God by your side. In conclusion, listen, I don't know what fears you're facing right now, but I do know this. God has already given you the power to overcome them. You don't have to live in fear anymore. You can live boldly, confidently, and courageously because God is with you. Remember Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? So, don't let fear have the final word in your life. Instead, let faith rise up. Let God's promises lead the way. If this message has touched you, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with someone who needs to hear it. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell for more content that will strengthen your walk with Christ. Let's break free from fear together.